to uh, see everyone uh, this afternoon. Glad you're able to be here. Um, good to see such a good group. So uh, this afternoon, uh, we had been, of course, going through our singing class. So this evening, or this afternoon, we're going to go back to the format we had prior um, to that. I'm, we're going to do a devotional period here at the beginning. Um, in f- just a few minutes, Brother Van's going to come and lead us in some songs, and then I'll share some thoughts with you, and then we'll give the invitation. And at the end, if anyone was not able to partake of the Lord's Supper, we'll give you opportunity to do that this afternoon. Before we get into that, though, I um, did want to just go over a couple announcements and and. Um, then we'll pray together. Uh, if you'll keep in mind, this Saturday is the um, Men's Fellowship in South Carolina, uh, Rock Hill. Um, and so we'll be taking a van leaving at 545 Saturday morning for any of the men who would like to attend. Love to have you join us for that activity. Um, of course, um, Joe Wells will be speaking at that event. He'll also be speaking to us the next, the following Friday, the 17th, beginning our gospel meeting. There are some flyers out there in the foyer. I um, invite you to please pick one of those up if, um, uh, if, if there's anyone you'd like to pass those out to or you just would like to keep one around the house. Uh, those are available. He'll be here uh, Sunday through, I mean, uh, Friday through Sunday. Uh, Friday and Saturday night at 7, and then Saturday morning. Uh, He'll be here for Bible class and worship. We'll have a fellowship meal and then an afternoon service at 1.30 where he will speak to us. So we're really looking forward to that. I hope um, you're making your plans to be here. Uh, Trying to think if there's anything else. On our prayer list, if we can continue to remember those that we've made mention of, Recently, I know there's several that were mentioned this morning. Uh, we're praying for, and just if you will, uh, please continue to remember those folks. Um, uh, if you haven't already, please pick up a bulletin. There's a list of individuals in there as well. If you will, before we begin in song, let's take a moment and have a prayer together. Almighty God and Father above, we thank you so much, Father God, for this day, Father, for loving us in such a overwhelming way. Father, please continue to be with us. We pray that you'll use us in your service. Father, that, that we will continue to be challenged and encouraged in our faith to, uh, to, to grow and to strengthen those areas where, where maybe we're weaker. We pray that you will continue to forgive us of where we fall short. Father, there are are many that are on our prayer list. There are several that we have been praying for. We pray, Father, that you will please keep uh, these individuals and their families in your prayers or in, in your hands as we pray for them. We pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless them and bless us as we reach out. Father, please bless our time this evening as we assemble and as we uh, share this time in worship. And pray, Father, that all that we do or say uh, and say are things that um, things that honor and glorify your name. All this we ask in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.
475. 475. will be our song after the lesson. Number 925. Good to see everyone again. Um, to take time and be here uh, uh, with us as we are gathering to worship. This afternoon, I just want to share a, a couple of thoughts with you, um, and I want to start by going to John chapter 3. Now, some of this, if you've been in my Thursday class, you'll be familiar with, obviously, uh, but, but I want to uh, go there and dig in just a little bit into what's going on in this chapter. John chapter 3, of course, is uh, on the conversation between Jesus and, and Nicodemus, and, and it regards... Uh, the kingdom of God and what's required of man in order to be a part of God's kingdom. Uh, and Jesus says some kind of provocative things to the mind of Nicodemus, where Nicodemus says, you know, the first time, how can these things be? I mean, how can a man when he's old go a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Uh, that sounds audacious in his mind. A second time, he'll say, how can these things be? And he's talking about the spirit and the working of the spiritual world. And, um, and so in verse number, verse number uh, 10, Jesus answers him. And he says, are you a teacher of the law and you do not understand these things? So obviously Jesus is implying that Nicodemus should have known what he was talking about. But Nicodemus had missed that message in the Old Testament. Sometimes for us as Christians, we miss what God's saying for a variety of reasons. Maybe it's a preconceived idea about the text, about what we think's there, and we're not willing or open enough to really study the text and look again at it. That's why it's important for us as students of the Word to always look at the Bible with fresh eyes, always considering maybe I get this wrong. So I need to look again. And, um, and so he says, you're a teacher of the law and you don't understand this. How can that be? And maybe he could say the same of us. He goes on to say, verse 11, uh, for the third time, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Well, why? Well, because they had all this this um, hidden agenda in their mind and heart of the way they, th they thought things should be, especially in regard to the Messiah. And that's a whole deep discussion on, on the Jewish perspective of the Messiah. But obviously Nicodemus isn't really understanding. And so Jesus continues to drive, to drive this point home. And so um, he says in verse 12, If I uh, told you earthly things and you do not believe... He's having trouble, isn't he? He says, how can you uh, believe if I tell you heavenly things? All right. If I try to take this to a deeper level, you're not going to understand me because you're not understanding the surface level stuff. And, and so it's the same is true with us sometimes, isn't it? We really need to, 
we need to open our mind up. We, we need to think about things in a new way. And, and so um, he then gives this, uh, this Old Testament example and applies it to the Messiah, and I want you to see it. So um, verse 14 and as Moses was, uh, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, without getting into a discussion about the Son of Man, uh, you can go back and research. You don't take my word for it, but that is a reference that he would have understood to the Messiah, to the Christ. That was a that was a phrase, Son of Man, that was applied to the Messiah. That's bonus coverage you didn't even get in our Thursday class. We didn't even go over that. But, but the Son of Man was an Old Testament reference to the Messiah, and it was something that Nicodemus would have known. So what is Jesus talking about? Well, let's go back to get the context. Let's go to Numbers 21. So when he says Moses lifted up a serpent, what serpent is he talking about? What happened? What is all this about? Go to Numbers 21. And let's spend just a minute there, if you will. So in Numbers 21, the, the children of Israel have, have been wandering for a while in the desert. Uh, Aaron has just passed away. And they're doing kind of what they do often, which is complain. Uh, verse 21, um, I'm sorry, chapter 21, let's go to verse 4. So from Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea. Now, they have essentially been going around in circles. They had an opportunity to enter the promised land a long time ago. But because of their lack of faith in God, God said, you're not ready. And that whole generation of adults who denied God, who denied faith in God, all died in the desert wandering. So they're going to spend 40 years wandering around. You ever driven around in circles? I remember the first time I went to Nashville with my parents. My parents aren't big travelers. Interstates is not something they're familiar with. They don't travel far. Uh, they've been, <laughs> I'm joking with Lisa, they've been, they, they came, they dropped me off when I went to Freed. They came to my graduation. They came to my wedding. I think when I die, they'll come back one more time. They, they just don't travel very much. I thought that would get a chuckle, but I didn't get anything out of that. Maybe that's just not very good material, I guess. Maybe it's too dark. But, but, but they, they don't travel. And so we came to Nashville. They didn't know their way around. I didn't know my way around. I'd never really traveled that much either. And so we got lost. And it felt like we were going around in circles. You go somewhere new, it can really feel that way. Well, they've been wandering around for 40 years. And they have complained a lot. Well, God, as he's done a few times, gets tired of the complaining. You've been on that trip, haven't you? The kids in the back. For about the 40,000th time, they've asked, How much longer? Are we almost there yet? All right, and I've tried every way I can to get that question eliminated from our conversations, but I've yet to accomplish it. So if you know the, how to do that, please let me know. Right? You ever get tired, and then, and then it reaches a level. We all got it. When you're as a parent, and you're trying to navigate, I've had it. All right, it's time. One more word, I stopped the car. All right? And God had gotten to his level. And, and so uh, they leave Mount Hor. They set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Eden. Here they're going around another land, right? Uh, and the people became impatient on the way. Uh, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of, the, uh, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. 
We loathe this worthless food. That's that's sounds like an echo from years ago, right? That they cried when they first came out of the land. They said, oh man, we remember the onions we used to eat there, all the spices and all the good food, and all we have is this worthless bread, manna from heaven. And here they are, they're complaining again about the food and the water. Now, has God ever let them go hungry? I remember at one point they're complaining and, uh, about having meat to eat, and God, what is God's response? I'm going to give them so much quail, they start, it starts coming out their nose, right? They're going to start throwing it up. And, but God is always taking care of them, but here they are again complaining. Well, verse 6, you um, have an interesting situation here. Now, God could have just destroyed them at that point. <laughs> And there are a couple of times when he threatens to do that, but he doesn't do that. But he does provide another. uh, Some of us don't like snakes in here. I'm looking at one in the back back there. He gets a little terrified at the thought. We've got another one or two here, but I know they're pretty terrified too. The text says, He sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many of Israel died. It doesn't give us a number, but it just emphasizes many. Uh, And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. It's like that child when they've been caught, and now the the belt's coming off or the switch tree is being gathered. And at that point, they're finally repenting. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and they're begging and they're begging. Well, here they, they, the serpents are out. They're biting people. Okay, it's time I pushed dad too far. I pushed mom too far. Here they push God too far. And, and so they cry out to God. He says, For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. All right, so please give us relief. Now, okay, so they're repenting. And... God has obviously the power to end this. He brought it. He can take it away. But I'm fascinated by what God didn't do here. That's what I want to think about here. So uh, he says, uh, so Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses does that. The text goes on to tell us that everybody who looked lived. But the question I really have in my mind, I ask it on the Thursday class, why didn't God just take the serpents away? He could have done that. I mean, right? But he doesn't. He doesn't even stop the serpents from biting the people. Isn't that fascinating? It is to me. Maybe not to you. But it is to me, I am fascinated by that. God doesn't just reach his hand down and smack those serpents and send them away or do whatever he could have done. He does offer them salvation. But it's something they have to work out. And so, there's so much more I'd love to dig deeper into this, but... This is such a fascinating interaction between God and his people. And I think it applies a lot to us. If you think about the scenario and what it represents from a New Testament connotation and what Jesus is trying to plot to, it's in regard to sin and salvation. Right? The serpents represent sin and what sin does to us. It bites us. It eats us up. It poisons us from the inside out. It causes us to die. And that pole represents salvation. And though God brought salvation, can any person who looked at that pole say to God, I deserve to be healed now. I've looked at your serpent. They can't, can they? The salvation still comes from God. There is nothing inherently powerful about a snake on a pole. 
There's no power in that pole, by the way. The power's in God. God never promised to take us out of the world. More than that, he never promised us that we would be safe from evil. He has never promised us that we would never be tempted. It's just the opposite, isn't he? He left us in the world. He left us in danger of sin. And yet he says, if you will look to me, I'll give you healing. I will help you. But you've got to do something. I demand your faith. By sinning, we've proven we, we chose the world over God. And now we must choose God over the world. And that's the scenario here. That was the scenario for the Israelite people. They had already chosen to forsake God. And now God says, now you've got to choose me. You've got to choose to look at my healing pole. You've got to choose to look to me for healing. I'm not just going to zap you and make you whole. That's not going to work. I tried to do that. I gave you manna from heaven. I provided water from rocks. I gave you a leader to send you through the desert. I sent you to a beautiful land flowing with milk and honey, and you denied me. And you have over and over again, and now I'm going to require something. You know, when God sent manna from heaven, did he require anything from the Jews? Jewish people. When he brought them out of Egypt, did he require anything of them? He did all that. All ten plagues were him. When they crossed the Red Sea, did he require them to do anything to part the water? No, God did it all. God did it all, and they still chose to sin. God has done so much for us. And when we sin, it is, a, it is a rejection of God to his face. And so God says, now, I will put a choice before you. You have to choose me. See, Jesus isn't going to snap his fingers and heal us of our sin. It doesn't work that way. He doesn't take away sin that way. He requires something on our part, and that is faith. In choosing God, we submit ourselves to what he's asked. Think about what he's asking us to do. He says, in order to be healed from your sin, you've got to confess Jesus as Lord. You've got to repent of your sins. But the key moment of salvation comes when you submit to being buried in water. That seems kind of crazy, doesn't it? Think about it just on its face, right? Think about it from Naaman's perspective, right? Naaman, when, it, when, when he was told, just go dip in the water seven times, God will heal you. That's not how healing comes, right? God says, you're going to have to do what I ask you to do in the way I ask you to. And I don't have to give you my reason. Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That is the only way, John 14, 6. That is the only way to God through Jesus Christ. God is not going to take our problems away. I was watching something today, and I found it fascinating. And it was a guy, an older man, talking about how he raised his children. And I'll end on this, and I'll give it to you. And I, I was really interested about it and convicted, just to be honest. He was talking about how parenting has changed as, from his perspective. And I've got to agree with it from my perspective. He says that when his children were younger, and he would give them a toy... And his son would play with a toy, and then the wheel would come off of the toy, and the son would come to the dad, and he'd say, Oh, Dad, my wheel came off here. And then, can you fix it? And dad would say, Well, let me look at it. He looks at it, oh, it's broken. And he throws it in the trash. 
I mean, it was kind of, whoa, what, what are you doing, right? Well, the son was like, why did you do that? He said, well, you're obviously not old enough for big boy toys, so I'm going to give you a baby toy. Well, the son did not like that, right? And then he says, well, the son says, well, maybe I can fix the toy. Oh, he says, okay. So he takes the toy out of the trash with a tire and hands it to the boy. The boy goes down and he puts the wheel back on and it works. The dad says, how did that happen? He said, well, I saw there was this metal thing here and if I just mashed the tire, I think there's something valuable going on there. And it's convicting for me. I don't know about you, but it's convicting for me. Too often we try to solve our children's problems. Instead of teaching them how to look for solutions. If we fix all of our children's problems, what in the end have we given them? But an attitude that says, well, if I ever mess up, somebody else will fix it for me. There's a value in learning to deal with our own problems. God says, I'm not going to fix every one of your problems. You go out and you steal a car while you're in prison. Somebody teaches you the gospel and you become a child of God. You submit. God doesn't get you out of prison. You've made a mess of your marriage. And in your low state, you, you see the error of your way, you repent, you become a Christian. God doesn't automatically fix your marriage. You've got to do some work. There's something God asks us, and there's a real value in that. Those things teach us to appreciate what we have. The children of Israel had been given so much, and they did not appreciate it. Appreciation is a valuable thing. Learning how to be good stewards with what God's given us is a valuable thing. It is a blessing. And it's challenging to me and to us parents that maybe I shouldn't solve all my kids' problems. It's okay, right? You need to help fix it. But even more so in our own lives, we respond in faith. God requires it. Hebrews eleven six. without faith, it is impossible to please God. This afternoon, do you need to respond in faith to God's call? Is there some way that we can help you in your walk with God? If you need to come and become a Christian, we'd love to help you do that this afternoon. Or if you're a Christian who needs some prayers, you need to ask for forgiveness or whatever it may be, we're here. If you'll take your song books now as we're led in 925, please come forward if you have any need.
just a minute. After the closing prayer, we're going to uh, the last leaders group. I hope you can stay if you can and take part uh, as we start to look forward to that. Anybody's welcome to stay. If you want to stay, uh, we'll transition to that. Okay. Does anyone have a need to take the Lord's Supper? I don't see any hands. Oh, do hands. Okay. All right. Would everyone be seated, please? Okay. May we pray for the uh, bread? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come worship you again this afternoon. At this time, Father, we ask your blessings on this bread, which represents Jesus' body that he so freely gave on the cross at Calvary that we might have the opportunity of everlasting life. We pray that those who partake of this do so in a manner pleasing to you at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If we can uh, continue our prayer for the cup. Our Heavenly Father, in a, in a likewise, uh, we offer a prayer for the fruit of the vine, which represents Jesus' uh, blood. We uh, are thankful that uh, Jesus is willing to come on this earth and, and give his life for each of us. At this time, we ask that those participating do so in a manner pleasing to you. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Also, uh, as we started during COVID, we have a uh, box at the back that we can make a contribution to the work here. And if, I'll offer a prayer that if you'd like to do so. Maybe, maybe pray. Our Heavenly Father, we again come to you in prayer, thanking you for a blessing each of us in so many ways. Father, uh, whether it be spiritual or material, we know that the blessings come to us through you. At this time, let us willfully and cheerfully give back to you. Again, we pray that the, the men use these in a manner pleasing to you. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Got a uh, good group here tonight. Glad everyone could... Uh, be with us. Uh, again, I remind you that next Saturday we're going to Rock Hill. I know we've uh, kind of run that in the ground today, but uh, it's kind of kind of always does kind of slips up on us. March 11th comes fast, or that second Saturday in in March uh, comes fast. We, we we know it'll be a great day. Uh, COVID has kind of affected it, but you know this this has been a day where th there would be like 500 men together, and uh, ho hopefully we're headed back in in that direction with our numbers. But we know it'll be a a g good day uh, for for us, and we look forward to it. So if you can go, please please make plans to do so. I'm gonna close us in prayer. May we pray. Father, we thank you for the 
beautiful sunshine. We thank you for the good health that allows us to be here this afternoon. We th thank you again for blessing us in so many ways. Father, uh, we pray for those that have, were mentioned this morning that are sick or afflicted. Pray that you will be with those and be with those that are, are looking after them and be with the, the doctors that are, are helping each one of them. Father, we know uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Sandra was back with us today, and it's good good to see her that that uh, she has improved, and we continue to pray for for her health, and uh, pray that we'll have more many more times like we did this day with with her here with us. Also, also the others that have uh, been mentioned, Father. Uh, as we go to our homes now, we pray that you'll keep us safe. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.